Good evening. I'm Tony Clark from the Carter Library. I'm sorry for the the delay, but we're really glad to have you here for what I think is a very important discussion tonight. You know, earlier today, I was giving a tour to some European diplomats next door over at the Carter Center. And as we were going through the exhibit, I, I told them about Carter's first run for the state Senate uh, in Georgia and how election boxes were stolen and put under a bed uh, when he, he ran. And under the initial count, he, he lost, but he didn't concede. And I think that's the reason President Carter has been so interested in free and fair elections all around the world. And I think it's an issue not only around the world, but here, here at home. That's why I think the Carter Presidential Center is the perfect place for discussion of Eric Holder's new book, Our Unfinished March, The Violent Past, Imperiled Future of the Vote, A History, A Crisis, A Plan. As you all know, Eric Holder is an attorney, a civil rights leader, former attorney general, in fact, the first African-American to hold that position. And he is currently the chairman of the, Democratic, uh, the National Democratic Redistricting Committee. Joining Attorney General Holder for tonight's discussion is former Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. She served as mayor during what I think we would all agree is one of the most challenging times in the history of this city. It was a time of not only the global pandemic, but racial justice movement. And she really became a leading spokesperson uh, regarding the challenges and the opportunities facing cities and leaders across America. She is currently a commentator for CNN. So please join me in welcoming Attorney General Eric Holder and Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. like one of the temptations here. I got a mic. Well, good evening. Thank you all for being here. Just to give you a warning, I have a timer set on my phone so that I will be obedient to the time that's been allotted for us to chat this evening. Um, and also one other housekeeping note, my mother is here. So mama, raise your hand, please. All right. <laughs> So thank you all for joining us for this great conversation. It is such a timely conversation, very much needed. There's this great book that's out, written by our Attorney General, and you had a co-author yep. with this book. So I want to go back just a little bit. I want to start at the beginning. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> so tell us about Eric Holder, the boy. Ooh. Um... That's an interesting question. Uh, born in the Bronx in New York City, um, moved for a couple of years to Harlem, 147th Street and 8th Avenue, and then raised in Queens for most of my life. Um, a quintessential New Yorker, you know, I went to high school in Manhattan, college in Manhattan, law school in Manhattan, and I thought of New York as the center of the universe. I was always, I took the New York bar exam anticipating that I would ultimately go back to New York, but I left uh, New York to go to DC just for a summer, and I've been there, you know, for like over 40, over 40 years now. But I, I, as a boy, I mean, I think I was, I was, I was inquisitive, uh, I was a sports fanatic, um, you know, I was a history buff, um, you know, just, a, but just, I think just, you know, an average young black guy in, uh, in Queens. So you were telling us downstairs about this encounter you had as a boy in Queens with this boxer named? Cassius Clay. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I lived at 24th Avenue and 101st Street. Uh, Malcolm X lived on 23rd Avenue and 97th Street. Uh, his house has now been made a, a museum place that was firebombed and all that. So I was in a candy store run by a guy named Mo. And my brother came flying into the candy store and said, 
Cassius Clay is outside, outside Malcolm X's house. So, I, so we run down there. I have a paper bag from Moe's, and I tear off a piece of the uh, paper bag, and I get his autograph. Now, this is right after he'd beaten Sonny Liston for the title. So he's the new champ, um, but he was still Cassius Clay. He had not changed his name. And I was kind of a, well, you asked me, I was a kid. I was kind of a smart ass. And you all will not maybe remember this, but before the fight, he had a very high, get his medical exam, he had a very high pulse rate, his blood pressure was high, and people said he was scared of Sonny Liston. So I said, after I got my autograph, um, were you scared of Liston? And he stood up, um, stood up, and I'm like scrawny and relatively small. I took his fist, and he went, what do you think? <laughs> and at that point, he had like, like, was like the largest human being I think I'd ever seen, and I went in my... I guess 12, 13 year old boys. No. Um, and so I had that autograph. I have that story. I saved, you know, saved it in my autograph book. And when I finally left Queens to live in, in DC, I asked my mom, Mom, where's that, that autograph book I had? You know, that, you know, and she said, Well, you never looked at that. So I, I threw that out. Note to all the mothers and grandmothers don't throw out the kids' stuff. It could be valuable one day. I mean, not Muhammad Ali's signature. I had Cassius Clay, you know? So you went to D.C., mm -hmm. fell in love with D.C., fell in love with someone in D.C. Mm -hmm. So which, which came first? I was in D.C. for, uh, for a while. Um, I, was, I worked at the Justice Department for 12 years. I'd been a judge for about five years. And I met this startlingly beautiful um, young intern who had just uh, come to Washington, D.C., who grew up in Mobile, Alabama, but who also has Atlanta connections. Um, her sister was a young woman who integrated the University of Alabama, uh, Vivian Malone, and um, it was her sister, um, Sharon Malone. And so I met her, that was in 1989, and we've been together ever since. All right. And you have how many kids? Um, three. Three children. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, this time in D.C. Ha has been pretty historical. Um, you've had many careers in D.C. Can you tell us about w what all you've done? Um, we, we know the last gig you had as the Attorney General, the but tell us about the last gig. <laughs> uh, tell us about the other jobs. Um, I started at uh, a thing called the Public Integrity Section. Uh, it's a part of the Justice Department in the criminal division that investigates official corruption cases, and I spent 12 years there. I tried cases as far east, maybe, as, I guess, Philadelphia, and as far, I guess, as west, uh, as Guam. Um, you, you know, you're going after public officials who are, who, you know, uh, betrayed the public trust. I then became a judge for five years, which I didn't like. Um, I was a, a judge at a time when Washington, D.C. was the murder capital of the country. We had more per capita homicides than any other city in the country. It was a time when D.C. was racked uh, by, the, by the crack wars. And I had to take this, this ocean of young black men, this wave of young black men, and, and put them in jail for sentences that I didn't think were appropriate because I had to do these mandatory minimums and all the stuff that Congress had passed. So uh, I left that job became the U.S. Attorney in Washington, D.C., did that for about four or five years, then I became the Deputy Attorney General, uh, went into private practice, and then I came out and became the Attorney General. My wife kept saying, you know, people are gonna think you can't hold a job. I mean, I kept moving all along all of these places, and as Sharon will say, every job I took was, was a pay decrease, and she kept thinking, this is not quite what I was expecting here, you know? Well, so I'm going to now move on to this great book, that you've written. So tell us, how did you come up with this idea? And it's if you don't have it, hopefully you will have it before you leave here this evening. How did you come up with the idea for this book? Well, you know, it's an interesting story. Um, Chris Jackson, who's the editor here, um, was the one who suggested that I write this book. Now, I signed a contract with um, Penguin Random House to write my memoirs after I left uh, the job as AG. That book is now five and a half years overdue. And Chris said, hey man, you owe us a book. Um, and he said, how about this, how about this? Take some time off from the memoir, write a book about um, what I think is gonna be important. And this was you know, a year, 
15, well, maybe a, a year and a half ago. I, I think we should focus on, you should focus on elections, the vote, the state of our democracy. And I said, okay, that's fine. But he said, you gotta give me a book. <laughs> I mean, this has gotta be something that we wanna have out uh, during the year of the midterms. And so he said, let's get this out by April, May of, of 2022. So that's what caused, that was the, I guess, the, the, the reason. And then as I got into it, I really kind of got into, uh, actually got into it to, to think about, all right, what's the state of our democracy now? What's the state of the vote in America in 2022? Um, how can we make it better? And then what about the history of it? I mean, let's look at the history of, what the vote has been like or, or people getting the vote in, in America. And I love the way that you d broke this down um, and you give a great historical lesson. So I'm just going to take it part by part. Part one, lessons from the past. First chapter, rebellion, how white men won the vote. A moment in the sun, how black men won the vote and white men stole it. Resistance in real politic, how women won the vote. Revolution, how black Americans won the vote and made America a democracy. So you take us through this great history, uh, much of course I didn't know, um, but can you, you take us, just give us some of those lessons from the past about voting? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that you do when you look at this, and I, I think, you know, people say, oh, well, the history of the vote, how interesting could this be? And so I, I thought, all right, what we'll do is we'll try to do this in a way that we'll focus on people and their stories, and by telling stories about people as opposed to saying, in 1815, in 1817, you know, uh, just focus on people's stories. I thought we could make it interesting um, that way. And so, all right, we said we started at the beginning. So who, who, who had the ability to vote? Well, one of the interesting things you'll see in the book is that when George Washington was elected president, only 6% of the people who we would now say are eligible to vote, only 6% of those people could vote. If you were a white man, you could vote uh, if you had property. But if you didn't have property, white men couldn't vote, women couldn't vote, enslaved people couldn't vote, Native Americans um, couldn't vote, only 6% of the people. And so that's the first story. How did white men without property um, get the vote? And we talk about a guy named Thomas Dorr uh, who foments a revolution, a, a rebellion in Rhode Island and says, you know, wait a minute, I, I can't vote. I, I, my father fought in the revolution, this is in 1840, my father fought in the revolution and I can't vote. Um, we're gonna put in place a new constitution in Rhode Island and he come, they run him out of Rhode Island, he comes back, he's put in jail, he dies a broken man. Uh, but ultimately, white men without property get, uh, get the vote. And so that's the first break. Um, and then you go to, to women getting the vote, uh, African Americans, and then there's a whole, you know, as we all know, African Americans get the vote. There's a period immediately after the Civil War where a multiracial democracy uh, seems to, is, is starting to flourish, only to be crushed by the weight of, uh, of Jim Crow and, and, and segregation. So we, the book is written kind of through various people, the stories, the, the stories that they can tell, some of whose names I think are gonna be familiar to you, many of whom you will, I suspect, uh, hear about for, uh, you know, for the first time. And as you write this book, you, you take us through your travels to Selma, Alabama, and by that time you had uh, tendered your resignation, I believe, for the third time. So before we get to the Selma story, tell us about the, the one, two, and three times you had to offer your resignation to the president. Yeah, you know, Barack Obama is my guy. Um, he was my president. He's my boss. He's my friend. And um, I was kind of tired. And, I, you know, I'd, I'd accomplished, I thought, a lot of what I wanted to do at the Justice Department. And I remember going to the Oval and saying, you know, I'm pretty much done, man. You know, it's uh, you know, it's time to get a new AG. And he said, "Well, you know," and he kind of talked me out of it as as only he can. And then when the president doesn't say okay, you can't say I'm leaving. It's like, all right. So that was attempt one, attempt two. I think same same kind of thing happened. The third time, I said, "Look, you know, it's six years." Uh, at that point, I guess I was the third longest serving AG uh, in history, and I said. I've got a couple, you just you know, about 18 months, two years or so to go, get somebody else to kind of, you know, to finish this off. And I, he, I remember he said, he says, all right, I'm gonna let you go. And I thought to myself, now the 
the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure that was the right reaction. He could have said, I accept your resignation or something like that. He said, I'm going to let you go, as if uh, he had, like, that power over me. You know? As if he's the president, right? <laughs> yeah, as if he's the president. And I guess he actually did have that power. So that was, it took three attempts. Um, and I remember coming home, and Sharon looked at me like, and I said, yeah. Because she also wanted me to, to leave and was disappointed with those first two um, failed attempts on my part. was happy with the third one. So you travel to Selma, and then the book you write, you were hoping for a bit of a delay uh, in the confirmation of your replacement because you wanted the opportunity to travel to Selma as the first African-American attorney general. So what was that experience like? Yeah, it was the 50th anniversary of the march uh, across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And I had quit in September uh, expecting, you know, well, I'll leave and I said I'd stay until my successor was named. I saw, you know, a couple of months, whatever. Republicans being Republicans, want to mess with Eric Holder just one more time. They said, all right, well, we're going to just leave him in office and leave my successor kind of, you know, just hanging in the wind. And then it hit me, you know, if I stay till about, I think it was about April or so, I could be AG and be in Selma on the 50th anniversary of the crossing of the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And I was like, okay, yeah, you guys, let, let me stay here in office. And so I didn't say anything to anybody. Um, but I kept secretly hoping that Loretta Lynch, uh, who you know came after me, I said, let's let Loretta get it after um, after the uh, after the fiftieth anniversary. So I got to go to Selma as the sitting Black Attorney General on the fiftieth anniversary of the crossing of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and got to give a speech at uh, at Brown Chapel. Well, I suspect had you let the Republicans know that you wanted to stay, they then had they would have. <laughs> if I'd say, hey, let me stay because I want to be the fiftieth anniversary, they'd have, they would have. Confirmed, you know, confirmed Loretta the next day. Why was that? Why was that so important to you? Why did you want to have that moment? Well, you know, it was. Um, I remember the '65 Voting Rights Act. Um, I remember the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and you know, watching on a black and white TV in Queens, you know, where I grew up, uh, seeing those images of these people go, trying to go across the bridge, and this guy named John Lewis. Um, and then these, what I thought were police officers, turned out they were state troopers, you know, beating them and all that. And I was like, well, you know, what is that all about? Um, I remember my, I, was, I guess I was 14 at the time. I had a sense of what was going on. I had a long conversation with my parents about, uh, you know, the, the need to vote, what was going on in the South. And I, you know, again, I had a fair sense, but that really kind of crystallized my view. And the notion that I could be back there on the 50th anniversary with the first black president, with John Lewis, um, invited to speak. Uh, George W. Bush was there. Um, I said, no, you know, this is something I want to be a part of, not as, a, as an observer, um, like the former attorney general, but to be there as the guy, you know, the first black attorney general um, to be in Selma. Because the reality was that but for what John Lewis and those marchers went through on that day, on Bloody Sunday, I probably wouldn't be you know, Attorney General. Brock probably wouldn't be, be president. And so uh, if you talk to Brock, he'll say the same thing. Uh, president Obama, well, uh, Brock. Um, if you talk to him, he'll say the same thing. That was a special day for him. And I quote pretty extensively in the book from his remarks that day. Um, it was one of his better speeches. He, he's got a lot of good speeches, but that was really one of his better ones. And it was one that he clearly felt um, in the same way that I felt, you know, moved by the fact that... Um, the circumstances under which we were there on, on that 50th anniversary. And we had the legend with us. You know, we had John Lewis, uh, John Lewis right there with us. And to see John Lewis hug Barack uh, before he, gave, he introduced him, Barack came up, he hugged him. John Lewis had tears in his eyes. It was, uh, it was, a, it was a really, really special day. There were thousands of people there. Um, and I was happy that I was there as, uh, as the Attorney General. And you married a wonderful woman, this extraordinary family. Vivian Malone Jones, as you mentioned, was your sister-in-law. I know her as Monica's mom. Um, um, and Vivian Malone Jones integrated the University of Alabama. And you all have probably seen the iconic pictures. And, and talking with your in-laws and, and your wife and Vivian and the family, do you think your vantage point and your thoughts about what was happening in the 1960s in Alabama 
was different from what they have relayed as, as their reality and their experience? Well, that's a really good question. Um, because I thought of myself as kind of a precocious kid <clears throat> who understood what was going on around the country and had an understanding of what I thought was going on in the South. I didn't understand it, but had a sense, I thought, of what was going on in the South. And it was a whole different deal to meet Vivian, um, Sharon, their brothers and sisters, and to hear them, for instance, describe what happened with Vivian on that day in June 1963, when she and James Hood integrate the University of Alabama. And her oldest brother, Elvin, said that they sat on the porch of their house with a shotgun that night because they had threats coming in about they were going to firebomb the house and do all of that. And then Sharon told me about uh, you know going to school and integrating a Catholic school in the first grade. She, another black kid. Uh, and the church, rather than saying, all right, this is a, a good thing here. We've got you know an integrated elementary school here. She's obviously, she was always the smartest kid in the class. They closed the school the next year. So she didn't... Rather, rather than integrate the school, they closed right. it. It's a Catholic church. They closed the school. And so, you know, to hear these, these stories, you know, you, you read about things in the New York Times or the Daily News, whatever the New York papers were, you watch things um, on the screen. It's a fundamentally different thing to actually speak to people who experience this. And not only the stories around 1963 and the integration of the University of Alabama, but to hear stories that Sharon and her sisters and brothers would talk about what their parents went through in the South. I didn't experience that, you know, in the North. Um, my father experienced, you know, some things, but on a day-to-day -day basis to hear the kinds of things that they had to, to go through, to live, uh, to try to vote, um, you know, the experiences of being an African-American in, in the South was really brought home to me by um, you know, the way in which they could personalize things. And that was actually one of the thoughts I had in, in the book to try to personalize this. Again, not give you a history book as much as to let people tell you, you know, their stories about, um, about the vote in, in, in America. You did such a great job because there are so many stories, so many names that we may not otherwise recognize. And you mentioned Dorr and, and so many others and, and Frederick Douglass's thoughts about voting. I think you said Susan B. Anthony said she'd rather cut off her right arm than women not have the right to vote. And then you move on. I'm going to move on to uh, the next section, part two, the crisis of the present. This could be a whole night long conversation about the crisis um, of the present. Um, you start with backlash to a black president, the Obama years, and then democracy and dissent, the Trump years. And then I just want to go back because I, I guess you had written a book, the insurrection happened, and you had to sort of do some tweaks to the book. Yeah. Cool. So let's, let's start with President Obama and what you witnessed firsthand with that backlash. Um, and then we can move on to the sure. guy after him. Yeah, you know, I mean, <laughs> Barack comes into office, he's elected in 2008, um, as in, you know, Grant Park that night. I think America thought that we had, we had gotten to a different place, you know? I never thought we were in a post-racial America. I, I'd never, I didn't buy into that, because that, you know, race and race issues are too deeply baked into our country to be it, have it a race by, by one election. And yet I thought we were in a different place. And yet, boy, I mean, as soon as he took office, it was like Republicans were out to get him, um, and then by extension, you know, get me, the other black guy. I, I was always told him, you know, they can't go after you in so many ways, your president and all that kind of stuff, but they can always get the other black guy, and that was me. Uh, and so, you know, that was, our, that was fine, that was fine. You know, I was born and raised in New York, I can take it. Um, and so, but the backlash started almost immediately, and you saw it in the way in which, you know, he was characterized, but also the way in which Michelle was characterized, you know. Um, all kinds of ugly things, you know, said about her in, in particular. It's, it's interesting because they, even as a black man in the presidency, there's a certain respect that gets accorded to that person. But for those people who surround him, they don't get that same kind of official respect, which isn't to say that they didn't treat him unfairly and they called him all kinds of names, but it was hard to see the things they said about, uh, you know, about, about Michelle. And so, and then you saw a political backlash, you know, the, remember the, the Tea Party rose, uh, 
uh, the 2010 midterms where Barack said the Democrats were shellacked. Um, a lot of that was, you know, because of the fight for health care. But I also think that there was, you know, the coalition that put him in office was something that scared uh, a good many people in America. In the same way as we talk about in the book, um, Reconstruction scared the status quo here in the South. And white people said, well, wait a minute. Multiracial democracy means we don't have as much power as we had before. You see Barack Obama and you see a multiracial coalition, especially of young people, putting him in office. And they said, nah, I'm not sure we like that so much. And so let's go after this guy. And as Mitch McConnell said, their primary job was to make sure that he was a one-term president. And they did everything they possibly could to, uh, you know, to make, uh, make that happen. He just happened to run into an extraordinary guy and he beat him twice and then got a second term. Did any, uh, has any of this surprised you? Any of the backlash or, or were you ready for it? Did you anticipate it? You know, it, it, another interesting question. I anticipated it, but not the, not the intensity of it, you know? I, I thought, you know, there'll be the political stuff. You know, Republicans are gonna go after Democrats because Democrats go after Republicans. And if we make a mistake, you know, they'll go, they'll go after us. I mean, I, I expect that. But uh, the intensity of the cr unfair criticism, the way in which, you know, I went to hearings, you know, you go to hearings and you're getting questioned by, you know, people on the Judiciary Committee, whatever, uh, and seeing the ways in which the questions were asked, um, the way their voices were raised, it was just kind of a, a different kind of deal. I served as Deputy Attorney General when Janet Reno was the, um, was the AG, and she's the first woman, and she wasn't treated particularly fairly either, but I didn't see her get treated in the same way that I did during those public interactions. Um, and so, yeah, I expected backlash and to be, you know, political backlash, but a lot of it seemed to be personal. And I always try to say to myself, or put out on my mind, I never said it publicly, that it was racial, you know? I, I never said that, but I was thinking it. You know, I never said it, but I was thinking it. <clears throat> and um, I think that at some level for some of those folks, the fact of a, a black man as president, a black man as attorney general, that was something that at some level they could not accept. It was something they were uncomfortable with, something they saw as threatening. And I'm not even sure that they realized it. You know, some did. You know, some of these idiots did. Some of them were just racist. But some of them, some of them didn't, you know. And so I think that was what, uh, that's what surprised me. This other guy gets elected president. Did you see that coming? Hell no. I mean, I would have bet my house, my kids, uh, my cars, you know, there's no way the United States of America is going to vote for Donald Trump. There's no way women in this country are going to support Donald Trump. Women vote in greater degrees than men. This is, going, this is a no-brainer. I was shocked. I mean, I remember when they, they were talking about, well, Pennsylvania looks like it might be leaning towards Trump. And I had my map out there, and I was thinking, whoa, whoa, this might, you know, this, this, is, this is not working out the way that I thought. So I was uh, totally, utterly shocked. And how, how can I? Well, I'm not going to artfully try. We're just to friends it. here. No. So <laughs> we knew he was awful, right? Was he even more awful than you thought that he was? Yeah, you know, he was, and I think this is really, I think it's kind of interesting. Hillary Clinton painted a picture for him, of him that I thought was overblown. And she said, he's a threat to our democracy. You know, he will trash norms. And I kind of thought, eh, you, know, you know, you got this in the bag. You don't need to be doing all this stuff. And he's not going to be, if he won, he's not going to win. He's not going to be that bad. And I, so I thought he'd be bad, but within kind of the realm of, you know, the acceptable. Like, this is good, this is bad, and he'd be over here, but within, and he's like, over here. And um, everything that Hillary said about him came to be true, you know? Um, didn't respect our institutions, made the Justice Department, uh, his private law firm, um, hired jokes as attorney general, um, and, you know, uh, that interaction with Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainian president, you know, trying to say, well, we'll give you, we'll give you what you need to defend yourself. You know, think about, you know, 
if that they'd had this stuff a little earlier. Um, but you got to open an investigation on Joe Biden. I mean, think about that. You know, that's who that that man became. Um, you know, president of the United States, and then the way he went out of office with a coup attempt, basically, to try to stop the, the transfer, the peaceful transfer of power. Um, he was a disaster, and we will be feeling the impacts of that na that presidency, the negative impacts of that presidency, presidency for decades. Where were you on January 6th? I was home. Um, you know, I'm a big events. I'm always watching television. Um, and so I'm watching television, and... Uh, I'm seeing people climbing into the Capitol, you know, a building that I know. I'd been there for meetings, hearings, you know, confirmation hearings, um, taking people on tours, you know. Uh, and it was one of those things where, you know, your eyes, you're, you're seeing something, but your mind's not kind of comprehending or allowing your mind to comprehend that which your, your eyes are saying, no, this is really happening. And it was a hard thing for me to uh, believe was actually occurring. And then, um, then it was like, well, how is this happening? Why isn't Trump telling people to get out of there? He waited so long. And it's interesting to see all the stuff now that's coming out from the January 6th committee. And I suspect we're going to really be shocked when the hearings start in, in June to see the number of people who were involved in that attempt, uh, that attempted coup, what Trump's role was in it, what was going on at the, at the Justice Department. Um, they were trying to basically overthrow our democracy. I was doing an interview that day, uh, actually with Christiane Amarpour. So I'm in front of my computer, Zoom, and I, I go downstairs and I see my husband and son watching television, which was unusual in the middle of the day. And they're watching it like they're watching a football game. And I looked and I said, what is that? And my husband's like, yeah, uh, well, there's some people going in the Capitol. They're uh, taking over the government. Like, just, <laughs> so I think everybody was in shock. And I said, what now? And he said, yeah, see that guy, he's climbing. And he, you know, it's taking me through this. And, I, and then I said, well, were you going to tell me somebody was overthrowing the government? And he's like, well, I mean, you're the mayor. I thought you would know there was <laughs> someone was overthrowing the government. <laughs> so I, I think it, it took us all a moment um, for that to sink in. So did your, you know, we all went from shock. Have you gotten to anger yet? Oh, yeah. Oh, I, you know, I went through whatever the stages are to get to anger. Anger, I was pissed off. You know, I mean, the... Um, what they tried to do, I mean, the physical harm to the building, all right, that angered me, you know, to see the building just trash in the way that it was, to see somebody walking around with the Confederate flag inside the Capitol, to see that idiot with that Camp Auschwitz T-shirt. I mean, these are just kind of little things I remember, the Camp Auschwitz T-shirt, um, to see them taking flagpoles and hitting, you know, police officers. Um, so just what I saw that day bothered me. And then when you realized what they were trying to do, and how widespread this conspiracy was. Um, this wasn't just a bunch of people on the mall marching into the Capitol because they lost control. This was an attempt. This was a constructed attempt to, to make sure that Joe Biden was not declared president on that day, which would give him time to fool around with you know, some of the votes in the other states and come up with a way in which Donald Trump would stay um, as president of the United States for a second disastrous term. And so I'm, I was shocked, I'm angered, um, and people have got to be held accountable for this. I mean, you know, it's a message has to be sent that what you did was unacceptable and you have to accept responsibility, but we also have to say to the future, we will not allow this to occur. People have to be deterred from thinking about doing something like this in the, uh, in the future. And, and you end the book on such an optimistic note. So part three is a more perfect future. Tell us about the future um, and, and also how, what, what can we do to make it better? Yeah. I mean, I think it is, at the end of the day, it's an optimistic book because in telling those stories in the first part, those people who fought to, uh, you know, for the vote. Um, we talked about Thomas Dore, you know, Alice Paul, this woman who, vote, who fought for 
uh, women's right to vote, uh, who marched down Pennsylvania Avenue in 1913 and was beaten along with other women, just want the right to vote. They were beaten. Um, 20, in 1917, she's out there demonstrating in front of the White House in what's called a night of terror. They take her out of the, from the White House, they go on a hunger strike, and they put a feeding tube down her nose, four or five feet, and feed her, force feed her. Um, that so shocked the nation that it actually moved President Wilson to support um, women's suffrage. So, you know, that story, those kinds of stories. And, you know, and then the people we know, Medgar Evers, Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman, um, civil rights folks, all who did impossible things at a time when they were physically, you know, at risk. Um, you think about those three civil rights workers in Mississippi in 1964, you know, Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman, and they were murdered during what was supposed to be a freedom summer. But people don't remember what they were doing was registering people in Mississippi to vote. That's why they were killed. The Klan said, wait a minute, you're gonna empower black people in Mississippi? No, you will, you will lose your lives um, for that. So that history and the success that they had, given what they faced, including you know, death, Medgar Evers, um, given the success that they had there, that leads me to an optimistic future that if we will commit ourselves in the way that they did, if we will sacrifice in the way that they did. And we don't even have to face all the things that, that they faced, but a committed American citizenry can overcome the things that now seem impossible. You know, and It doesn't mean it's, if we all get together and leave this room and say, all right, we're gonna save the vote and we're gonna have a great democracy, it's gonna happen overnight. It's gonna take time, um, but if we stay together, if we stay focused, we can pull this off. And people say, well, how could you say that? And I said, because I look at history, you know? Every time a bunch of people got together and said, all right, white men are gonna get the right to vote, women are gonna get the right to vote, African Americans are gonna get the right to vote, the African Americans are gonna get the right to vote again, you know, gotta do it twice for us. Um, that every time we've done that, we have been successful. And I don't have any reason to believe that Americans can't now do the hard things. And I, I think it's incumbent upon our leaders to think, to imagine this. I mean, you know, if you, you have to imagine success. If you can't see what success might be like, you'll never achieve it, you know? So Dr. King, I was, I was, did something today with Andy Young, John Lewis, you know, they never, they, they had to imagine a, an American apartheid system being destroyed. They had to imagine it. They'd never experienced it but they imagined it. And if we can imagine an America that returns to its flawed founding documents and treats people equally and gives everybody the right to vote, we can get there. But positive change isn't promised. It only happens when people um, work, sacrifice for it. But we can do it. So I know we've got to get to questions from the audience, but there are two important areas that we didn't talk about, the Supreme Court and these maps. So can you give us your quick thoughts on both of those right. before we go to our questions from the audience? Yeah, Supreme Court, there's a chapter in there about how I, we I talk about how we're going to fix Congress, the presidency, the Supreme Court. You know, well, I figure let's get ambitious here. Let's fix everything. Um, Supreme Court, um, they all serve too long. You know, you shouldn't be in an unelected position and serve in that position for 30, 40 years. So I said, you know, 18 year terms. Um, and this is one where the Chief Justice and I agree. He said 15 year terms, I say 18, all right, that's fine. Um, I think you need to expand the court because Republicans stole two seats. You know, Merrick Garland doesn't get a hearing because it's too close to the election. It's like 230 days away from the election. Amy Coney Barrett gets put on the Supreme Court while people are voting. That's two seats that um, Democrats should have, or Democratic president should have had the ability to fill. And the court, a whole bunch of decisions would be different. We wouldn't be dealing with the Roe versus Wade decision right now. It would be a fundamentally different court. So expand the court, term limits, and then also have a way in which presidents pick a Supreme Court justice in their first year and in their third year. First year and third year. So that, and with 18 year terms, you'll ultimately get back to a court that has nine members but you'll have a regularized way in which you get new blood on the court, and maybe that'll depressurize some of this 
you know, the political theater that we have to deal with every time there's a Supreme Court nominee. Line drawing, redistricting. We redistrict every um, 10 years. I'm the head of the National Democratic Redistricting Committee. We said Republicans did a great job for themselves in 2011. Democrats were asleep at the wheel, and we said we're going to make sure that as best we can that the process in 2021 is as fair as it can be. And I think we've done a pretty good job. We will have elect. We will have. We've had a redistricting process. It's almost finished. That is more fair this year than it was back in 2011, and that'll mean that we won't have as many gerrymandered legislatures. Though there's still going to be a few. And you here in Georgia got a gerrymandered legislature. I want to tell you. Um, and so we've made progress in a lot of places, but Texas, Georgia, Florida, Wisconsin, uh, those are the states that still are not in the place where, uh, where we need to be. But the process has been more fair. And when the process is more fair with regard to line drawing, that means you will end up with people at the state legislative level and in Congress who represent the will of the people. And so let's get back to Roe. If you had a legislature that really represented the will of the people, you would not see these bills because the people don't support taking away from women their reproductive um, choices. All the polls, and now the polls are showing, you know, it's like a two to one margin, you know, 60 to 30 people saying you should not overturn Roe versus Wade. But if you're in a gerrymandered district, you're in a safe seat. And it doesn't matter what it is, you can do things inconsistent with what your constituents want to do and not suffer any electoral consequence. So you can vote for a heartbeat bill, you know, we're gonna overturn Roe versus Wade and still get reelected, even though your constituents don't want that to happen because you're in a gerrymandered district. So one of the things we had to do was convince people that redistricting, gerrymandering had an impact on people's lives. It wasn't some kind of you know, political thing that makes your eyes glaze over. If you care about a woman's right to choose, if you care about criminal justice reform, if you care about protecting the right to vote, all of these things are directly connected to uh, who serves in state legislatures and how those lines are drawn. All right. Are there any questions from the audience? And we have, we have microphones both over here and over there. It's a great opportunity for you to, uh, to ask questions of the Attorney General. Why don't we start right over here? I think you can also ask the mayor questions if you want to. You know, she's right here. <laughs> I'm, I'm old news. <laughs> uh, well, I'll pose it to both of you all because I'm very interested in your thoughts on this. But in this recent push to ban books to which our school children um, have access to um, and a move towards not teaching historical facts that make uh, a certain group of children feel uncomfortable in the classroom, um, how then do we protect um, the value and importance of voting in the younger generations that are coming behind us if they're not even taught or exposed to that information? You know, that, that really it concerns me as a parent. I have one in college and, and um, three, one going into high school, two will be middle school. And I remember third grade, my teacher reading Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry to our class. And this was a white teacher in a primarily African-American class. And I, I believe I've seen that on a banned book list. Mm -hmm. I remember reading The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison in the eighth grade and went on to college. And my major was journalism. My minor was English with a focus on African-American literature. I took a whole class on Toni Morrison's body of work. So, Having read that when I was 12 or 13 put something inside of me that, that made me pursue learning more about her in college. So I think about these personal touch points that I've had listening to my teacher read that book to our class and it, it sparking this joy for reading. And I, I am deeply concerned um, that our kids will not only miss that, but also understanding this history that we talk about. Um, there was a, a school board recently that was gonna do some diversity training and they scratched it because they were concerned um, about running afoul of critical race theory restrictions. So I, I, I think it, it is all interconnected. Voting, education, um, 
this attempt to rewrite history, I think it's all connected, and I think we should all be very concerned about that. Well, and think about this, just really briefly. Think about this kid in Buffalo, right? He's there listening to all this trash that's coming over the internet through social, um, you know, social media. If he doesn't, if he's not versed in history, doesn't have a capacity to understand what really happened, all of that stuff seems real, you know? Replacement theory, you know, Jews will not replace us, African Americans, you know, all the stuff that he hears. Without any counterbalance, if he's not taught what his, our history, and this notion that our kids will be uncomfortable, you know, first off, our kids have a greater capacity to, to, to learn and, and take into account you know, painful truths than these nuts are, are, are saying. You know, that, that, that's, that's number one. And the other thing is that why would you want to teach or not teach a complete and accurate history of this country? Because that's, I think, America at its best. You know, there are those instances where Americans said this thing, whatever it is, we'll talk about voting, was imperfect and we made it better. Maybe it didn't get to where it needs to be, but we made it better. And those are the instances where America is at its best. And you will take that away from, um, you know, from kids, kids as well. Kids can, can learn about the enslavement of other people. They can learn about lynchings. They can learn about um, segregation, Jim Crow. They can handle it. They can handle it. The reality is that this is a wedge issue. You know, this is something that they think they can drive their base to the poles with. But they do so, I think, and endanger the physical safety of people in this country. You know, because as I said, social media, they're coming and saying, oh, you know, all, all this, this negative false stuff. And if there's no education to, to push back, you know, slightly unbalanced people, access to guns, and you see what happened. Thank Other you. Other questions? I have one in the meantime. How do you convince people that say voting for a president is important because it determines who's on the Supreme Court, or that voting a particular way will determine how the congressional district is lined up. How do you show them that that's important as aside from all the other things that are out there? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, it's something that, frankly, Republicans have done better than, um, than Democrats. Republicans have understood that elections at the state and local level are really important. You know, Democrats, we get all excited. Oh, Barack Obama's running for president. I'm going to vote. You know, 2008. Barack's up for re-election in 2012. I'm going to vote. Or go vote for him and not vote down ballot. Exactly. 2010, oh, I'm not going to vote. You know, he's not running. You know, 2012, oh, I'm not running. And what happens? You know, but Republicans get to the polls. Um, and so we've got to understand on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, who your mayor is, who is in your state legislature has a greater impact on your day-to-day -day life than who the president, who the president is. Um, and when we understand, you know, who these local officials are in terms of what our kids get taught in schools, who counts the votes in elections, um, we've got to somehow make this real in a way that we have not before. I'm talking about progressives and, and, and Democrats. Uh, and I think maybe the way to do it is, I hope, you know, we, the way we were successful in the book, I hope, which is to tell stories, you know, not to get wonky about it, um, but to give people specific, you know, examples. You know, uh, president is important, and one of the most important things a president can do is appoint people to the Supreme Court, and this is what the Supreme Court does that affects your life. This is how a Supreme Court nomination, a Supreme Court choice, a Supreme Court justice will impact your life. That is a, the way I think in which we finally get people to, uh, to think about, uh, among other things, why picking a president will have that impact uh, with regard to a Supreme Court choice. Personalize it. Mayor Bottoms, A.G. Holder, I want to thank you both for everything you have done to promote democracy. I think we should give them a round of applause. And I have a question that's a slippery slope, and I know that legislation wasn't your gig, but A.G. Holder, what do you think about the filibuster and what should be done about it? That's in the book. It's in the book. <laughs> Gotta go. Gotta go. Um, and the history, again, 
understanding history. The founding fathers said, we don't want to have super, the requirements of super majorities. It should simply be majority rules because Hamilton, as we quote in the book, Hamilton says, if you put into effect these super majorities, and that's what filibuster is, super majority, if you do that, then the minority actually rules. And so the filibuster has got to go. Um, you know, again, statistics that, that are in the book, you know, the nine most populous states in the country, just nine states, um, have just 18 senators, and yet they have close to 80% of the population. So you think about it, those other states, you know, have the ability to filibuster and keep 80% of the country from getting what it is that they, they want because of the filibuster. But when this was considered, I mean, they talked about, you know, whether or not we should have, what should be the level at which things are accepted, 50%, 60%, whatever. They rejected all notions other than 50%. Um, and so that's why I make, in, in terms of reforming the Senate, that's one of the things that I have in there. You have to do away with the legislative, uh, legislative filibuster. The only time, the filibuster has been used by McConnell and the Republicans recently almost as a matter of course. Everything has to have you know, 60 votes. Before, it was only used to fight civil rights bills when you were, again, empowering people of color. Whoop, filibuster, can't do that. Whoop, can't do that, can't do that. Um, and every other filibuster attempt was knocked down except for those in, the, in history, except for those that tried to stop and successfully stop um, civil rights bills until you got to the civil rights bill in 1964. Thank you, and you just sold another book. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, for, um, from both of your perspectives, um, why do you think that Republicans have been so effective at manipulating the, um, the levels of, uh, of electoral politics and what lessons do Democrats need to learn? Play the long game. Um, you know, I, I often feel that we are reactive mm -hmm. and Republicans seem to be much more methodical and aren't necessarily responding to the challenges of the day, but they're, they're planning years and years and years out. Um, even if you, you think back of, of how they discredited Hillary Clinton going back to the time that she was first lady, um, I would imagine they could see that this was a star mm -hmm. on the rise. And, and it just seems like a, a much more methodical um, plan, and I, I don't think we've perfected that. I think that's, I think that's 1,000, no, 2,000, a million percent right. Mm -hmm. Play the long game, you know? It's something that we don't do well as progressives and as, as Democrats. Um, it's one of the reasons why, you know, I, led, I lead the National Democratic Redistricting Committee. We had a successful redistricting effort in 2021, and so the natural Democratic thought would be, all right, that's good, we did a good job, we're done. No, we're gonna stay, I'm gonna stay there, we're gonna keep the organization going in anticipation of the redistricting in 2031, mm. so that the things we didn't get done now will get done in 2031, and also will protect the gains that we made in 2021. And that's just one small example, but playing um, the long game and being able to speak to people where they are, you know, don't, you know, we, we talk about programs and everything, you know, people, what was it, you, you govern in pros, out of whatever, right? But, but we need to be able to speak to people in ways that they understand that the policies that we're putting in place have a positive impact on their lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And you talk about the child tax credit and how important that was. Well, what the hell does that mean? You know, to, if it means, you know, a, a, a young mother is going to get, I don't know, whatever, $1,500 a month, $1,000 a month, talk about that. Talk about the ability to buy groceries, to pay rent. You know, break it down for, for people. Um, it's easier to sell fear than it is to sell hope. Hmm. And Republicans are good at selling fear. Uh, and so we need to dial a little of that in, too, but in this way. 
you all need to be, America, you all need to be really scared of what these Republicans will do if they win in 2022, mm -hmm. or if they win the presidency back in 2024, given what it is that you've seen them do recently, the inability to criticize Trump for trying to pull off a coup, the way they favor the special interests. I mean, we need to dial that into all the pro positive programmatic stuff, and I'm gonna say it in a good way, dial in a little fear of, of who, these, who these people are, you know? Mm. Yeah. Let's just do two more questions because I know the Attorney General's got a flight to catch tonight. Let's go over here. All right, I'll be quick. Um, great job, Mayor Bottoms. Um, great to be a resident, proud to have been a resident of Atlanta under your leadership. Can't wait to get into your book, uh, Attorney General. Um, I could talk politics all day, it'll make me angry, so I won't do that. But I will ask about whether you address the Electoral College in your book, the antiquated system how we're gonna deal with that in the future, will it ever change? And on a lighter note, you talked about your, your friendship with uh, President Obama. Do you ever have a chance to just talk about the Bears or the Cubs or the Bulls, <laughs> or does it always revert to, to politics? No, that's, all right, so we'll, we'll start with the most important question, the second one. Um, <laughs> the first time I met Barack was at a dinner in Washington, D.C., um, and we sat next to each other. It was put together by um, a woman who's a friend of both of ours, who said that he'd just been elected senator and didn't know many people in DC. And she said, well, you need to meet some folks in, in DC. So he sat next to me and we kind of hit it off talking about basketball, um, sports. Uh, and he's like this you know, big Chicago guy. Oh, so we totally got into it, mm -hmm. totally got into it. I mean, you know, Chicago Bulls, New York Knicks, mm -hmm. Michael Jordan, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you know, like, I mean, it's kind of like, I thought I was gonna like you, but like, you know, <laughs> your sports things, but we bonded over that whole sports thing. I mean, he's a sports nut, you know. Um, I'm maybe a sports nut light, not quite as intense as he is. Um, now, I heard you all used to play basketball after work. No. Is that true? No. That's not true. You can't play basketball against the President of the United States. If you get too close to him, the Secret Service would shoot you. <laughs> so, no, but, and I'm, I'm, I'm 10 years older than him, but in my prime, in his prime, you put prime Eric against prime Barack, come on. <laughs> I was born and raised in New York City. He's from Hawaii. <laughs> Greatest ball players in the world from New York would be Dr. J, Kareem, Tiny, you know, Tiny Archibald, tons. Chris Mullins, you know, the best ball players in Hawaii are. <laughs> You know, who, who, who? I don't think this is the first time you've said that. <laughs> I never say it in his presence. <laughs> and please don't share this with him. Um, and I'm so, what was the first? Uh, what was About the, the Electoral College. Oh, yeah, that's in the book. Uh, electoral College, got to go. Um, but to do it, you'd have to have a constitutional amendment. And Republicans will never go for that because it gives them um, power. So here's the deal. There's this thing called the National Interstate Voter Compact where the states have agreed to say, all right, we're gonna take our electoral votes and we won't vote for, we won't cast our votes for who won the state. We'll cast our electoral votes for who won the national popular vote. Hmm. And if you get states that total 270 electoral votes, that means that the person who won the popular vote would also get the greatest number of electoral votes. And we already have states who have signed up totaling 195 electoral votes. So we need to get that additional 75 votes from a variety of states. Michigan is the next big target in that way. I talked to Governor Whitmer about this, I guess, maybe three, four, five months ago, um, to get a few other states to go along with this. And then you would have an electoral college, but the electoral college would be directly tied to the popular vote, and you wouldn't have Trump winning even though he got fewer popular votes, you wouldn't have George W. Bush winning, even though he got fewer electoral votes. So that's in the book also. Okay. I think there was another gentleman back here. Greetings, uh, Attorney General Holder and Madam Mayor. I, I, I'm a native of Atlanta, I grew up here, and I've seen this place change 360. I'm a little bit older than the mayor, and uh, how do we get America to embrace progress when you're talking about a southern city has started out, you know, in the uh, segregated south, but has blossomed to become a main 
you know, on the main stage across the nation. How, so how did we get that? We got, we had a lot of progress and change here. And I always say, I grew up in Atlanta and every mayor we had has been black. But white Americans in, in the city of Atlanta has, they, people still prospered. So it's like when Barack Obama became president, it rattled a lot of people. But it's like, we moving forward, we move into a better place, but people don't want to embrace that. So how do we, and Atlanta to me is a perfect example because it's a progressive city. And while we can't get America to, I guess, piggyback or take that and run with it. We need Ambassador Young for this one. Okay, okay. Yeah. You know, I mean, and I've heard Ambassador Young talk about the, the difference in decisions that were made by leadership in Atlanta as opposed to Birmingham and how it literally changed the course of history. 1964, uh, the southern mayor of Atlanta went to testify before Congress. Um, that just didn't happen in other places, but it goes back to the question that was asked about elections. Elections matter. Leadership matters. Local leadership matters. And I, I, I believe because Atlanta was very thoughtful. We had this great native son, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Atlanta University Center. Um, so we, in, in many ways, we, we had a, a good toolbox and some really good representatives. Um, I was born and raised in Atlanta, so I can't speak to how that can necessarily happen in other places, but I know how it happened here. Um, so maybe you can tell us, how does that happen? I'm not sure, America? you know, but I do know one thing. It is, um, it's hard to demonize a people or other people if you know people, if you know people. It, it's, it's, uh, let me put it, it's hard to demonize African Americans, if you interact with African Americans, you know, uh, if you are, and that's one of the values of we in the fifties integration. You know, I mean that's one of the real values. I mean, first of all, it, it, it ensures equal treatment for uh, African American kids, but it also brings the races together. And it's hard to stereotype and, and demonize people if you work with them. And so that's something that happens in Atlanta, but you know, in other places. Um, I remember gave this speech I got in a lot of trouble with when I gave this Black History Month speech, and I said that um, you know America is still really segregated, that we work together pretty well, but when it comes to things outside the workplace, you know, still black, still white, still Hispanic, whatever. Uh, and that notion, if we get to know one another, I think people are more willing to concede that um, you've got great mayors who can a great mayor who can be a woman can be a black woman and you can point to you know positive achievements and that makes you know the next person who is black and who is a woman you know you know trailblazers that makes the next person makes it easier for the next person to get that job but we need to replicate what you have here in other parts of the you know other parts of the country and I think it was um, Mayor Ivan Allen testified in 1964 in favor of the Civil Rights Act Okay, last, last question right over here, and we'll do it briefly. All right, Cheryl McAfee, how are you this evening? And thank you, Mayor Bottoms, for taking on the city for four years with such grace and dignity. Thank you so much. <laughs> you know I love you. <laughs> and thank you, uh, Eric, for all you did for social justice. But, and my question is, Rens Priebus back in the early 1990s talked about if you own the state, you own the White House. And you also mentioned the long game. Is there anything in your book that can speak to how we start that same trend to own the state and then own the White House? Yeah, I mean, one of the things we talk about in the book is, um, again, when what I've dedicated uh, my time to as the head of the NDRC, the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, is fighting gerrymandering, you know? Gerrymandering allows politicians to pick their voters in deciding, as opposed to citizens choosing who their representatives, you know, ought to be. And so fighting that allows um, people to actually express their will in choosing who their elected local and state representatives can be. That, I think, is really kind of the key. You know, if you can unlock... Um, the, the problem of gerrymandering, we can control, progressives, Democrats can control more states. 
And what also, if you break up gerrymandering, if you're gerrymandering, you don't care about a general election. You only care about a primary. And it drives people further and further to the right. And to be fair, sometimes drives people further and further to the left. If you break up gerrymandering, well, then you don't have to cater to the right as much. You'll, you'll end up with more centrist people, both on the left and the right, and certainly more on the Republican side. And so I think that's one of the ways in which we get uh, the American people, not even Democrats, the American people get control of, uh, you know, of, of the states. And I mean, I think that ultimately for Democrats, because the reality is demographically, ideologically, this nation's changing. You know, it's often said that this country is a center-right country, and we just keep saying that over and over and over again, but the polls show that's not right. Not you know, if you go issue by issue, people are going, trending more and more left than they are right, more progressive than they are um, conservative, and you see these demographic trends uh, where the, the country's gonna be more brown than white. Now, the first week it was 2050, now it's 2043. Um, the biggest voting bloc in the country now are young people, as opposed to my people, you know, baby boomers. They are far more progressive than baby boomers are. And so this nation needs to, our, our leadership, our political system needs to catch up with where the people are. And so that, I think, is, uh, has got to be a goal of ours. Thank you. Eric Holder's new book, Our Unfinished March, is really a call to action. Acapella Books has autographed copies for sale in the, uh, the lobby. It has been a fascinating discussion. Please join me in thanking Attorney General Eric Holder <laughs> and Mayor Peter Lance Bottom. And if you'll keep your seats for just a minute while we uh, escort them out so we can get him to the airport. Thank you all very much. <laughs>